Let's talk about the Wharfdale Super Denton. This speaker pair was loaned to me by a viewer. I want to give him a shout out and say thank you very much for sending these my way to review. A uh, retail price on these is about 1400 bucks. They are a three-way design with a one inch soft dome tweeter, a two inch soft dome mid-range driver, and a six and a half inch woven Kevlar woofer. Now you'll notice that the layout of these drivers is not symmetrical. So you have the tweeter to the side of the mid-range and then the mid woofer in the middle. Now my overall impression of the speaker is that I do like it. I actually do like it. Um, it's very reminiscent of the Wharfdale Linton 85, which I know a lot of you people have probably seen my review of. I am very, very fond of that speaker. I think retail price is somewhere around $1,700. I know it fluctuates depending on if it's on sale or not, and if you buy the stands with that particular speaker or not, but it's just without the stands, it's somewhere in that ballpark of $1,700. So if we take that price delta and then compare that to the Wharfdale Super Denton, which I'm reviewing here, uh, you're talking about $300 difference or so. Which one would I personally buy? Well, I'd go for the Linton just because it's a it's a bigger speaker, gets down lower, and it is a little bit more linear on axis. However, the Linton does have a more noticeable scoop in the mid-range, upper mid-range area, which makes it kind of sound a bit more laid back than this particular speaker. However, this particular speaker does also have a bit of a laid back sound to it. But the difference between the two speakers, if we ignore the low end and just talk about maybe the mid range and up, it's very interesting. So what you'll find with the Linton is that the on axis response is more linear, whereas the Super Denton on axis response is a little bit less linear. Now then if you take the estimated in room response or typically what you're gonna find in a typical room, uh, the estimated interim response for the Super Denton is a little bit more linear than it is for the Wharfdale Linton. And then that's when things like your room really do start to play into a factor. If you have absorption for a speaker like this, probably, probably would make a little bit more sense to absorb some of those sidewall reflections to capture that off axis non-uniformity in the horizontal dispersion, just again, because of the asymmetrical layout. But otherwise, I don't necessarily think that it's necessary. So while they do have a similar timbre overall, they are different as well. Of course, I am going off of oral memory, but I'm also going off of the data that I just looked at to help me refresh what I'm talking about. So I'm kind of going into this with some, what was my impression of the speaker back then versus what does the data show as well? The main characteristic that you're probably gonna notice is the base, and that's due to the size. So if you don't want a large speaker like the Linton 85, but you kind of want that same overall sound, then maybe the Super Denton makes sense for you because it's just a more compact, uh, not a version of it, but it's a more compact speaker with a similar sound profile to it as the Linton 85. In my listening room, I'm about 10 feet away from the speakers. And in this particular case, I had the speakers out from the wall by about three feet. So roughly three feet off the wall to the back of the speaker. Now you can push the speaker up closer to the wall. It won't really impact the response too much in regards to how, how do I want to say this? Because the F3 on this speaker is around 60 Hertz, you won't get a lot of extra mid bass bloat that you might if the speaker extended lower. Now that can be a pro or con depending on what you want from the speaker and how you want it to look in your room. The other factor here is that there is a little bit of a mid range scoop. And I mean like a little bit of a mid range scoop from about 200 to about 800 Hertz. Now placing this speaker a little bit closer to the wall because it's still radiating toward the rear a little bit up to maybe about 500 Hertz or so, that's going to lift up that lower mid range a little bit more and give you a little bit more chestiness out of the mid range than it would if the speaker were placed further out from the wall. Now I don't necessarily think that the scoop is a bad thing in this particular speaker. There are other speakers that have a much more noticeable mid-range scoop, but I do notice it with this particular speaker, especially when I was ABXing against the Kefplay 2 Metas, which I'm sending back soon. 
Wah, wah. And another thing that I noticed in my ABX listening was that the Super Dentons have a little bit of an upper mid-range scoop. And with this little bit of that scoop there, what you are more likely to notice is music that has an aggressive nature to it is going to sound a little bit more subdued. Now, I'm not saying that you should buy a speaker based on a genre of music. There's all sorts of music examples throughout all sorts of different genres where maybe it's recorded a certain way. Maybe an instrument sounds a certain way. Maybe it was mixed a certain way. And the track just may not may not sound good to you because maybe it's too aggressive or maybe it doesn't have enough bass or whatever. And in those particular cases, what I did notice is that maybe some of the aggression was taken out of those particular tracks. Now, I'm not saying that you should also buy speakers to do certain things. I don't really, I don't really believe in that, but I am relaying to you that that's what I noticed when I was listening to those kind of tracks. In an ideal world, maybe it's a little bit more smooth through that region. I find that I like a little bit more of a neutral speaker. But having said that, this particular speaker still sounds good. It's not like the mid-range dip and this particular area were extremely noticeable, but they were noticeable in my ABX listening. There's also a resonance in the data that you're going to see that I want to go ahead and address up front because I don't want to spend a lot of time on it when I get to the data. It's around 700 hertz. It peaks up a little bit, maybe like two decibels or so. I didn't hear that in my initial listening. So, so for those of you who don't know, I do all my listening first, then I do my measurements, and then usually I'll go back and listen again if I have the time. So I didn't notice that in my initial listening, and I saw the data, and I thought, well, that's interesting. So what I used was some equalization to bring that down a bit. Two decibels, Q of four, right at around 660 hertz. And then I AB'd between EQ and no EQ. And I, I AB'd a lot, so I, I finally got to the point where I didn't know if I had EQ enabled or not, just manually. I didn't know. Like, oh, I can't remember which one is which. I'm doing my eyes closed. With my eyes closed and having forgot which setting I was on with EQ or not, I got to the point where I really couldn't tell. You know, that if you've ever tried to do blind listening tests, you are trying so hard to see if you hear a difference. Sometimes you psych yourself out. And I think that was the case. Now, when I knew which setting I was on, I could hear a difference with pink noise. And with the pink noise without EQ, it sounded more concentrated around that area and it stood out a little bit more, but it wasn't offensive. When I switched to actual music, I never heard the difference. I, I really couldn't. Like if I thought something was there, it might've been, but I don't know. So having said all that, what you're gonna see in the data at around 700 Hertz, that resonance, I gotta be honest with you, I didn't hear it. I wish I could tell you that I had golden ears and that I heard it, but without pink noise and without knowing which one I was on, I can't confidently say that I heard that particular resonance. Let's talk about the bass a little bit. The bass in these speakers, as I said previously, extends to about 60 hertz or so. We'll see in the data exactly where it is. Uh, F3. And the F10 is, I want to say it's like around 40, but we'll see again a little bit. Regardless of what the actual number is, what I heard in the room is that they just don't dig low, right? And I'm not necessarily expecting them to, given the small form factor of the speaker. In that regard, I think it makes more sense to put the speaker a little bit closer to the wall than I typically would recommend. Now, maybe a foot, two feet or so would be adequate. You might have to play around with that. But in doing so, you'll boost up that lower bass a little bit more and get you some more pop, punch, pizzazz, slam, throttle, I don't know, all those key buzzwords. But basically, you'll extend that response down a little bit lower thanks to the boundary reinforcement from the speaker or from the wall behind the speaker. As far as aiming and setup goes, aside from distance from the wall, I actually prefer these speakers pointed directly at me. I felt like if I towed them out too much, I lost a little bit too much treble, upper treble. Uh, pointing them directly at me didn't result in any kind of issues with the fraction. And by the way, all this testing and listening was done with the grill on. I forgot to say that earlier, but these speakers are designed to be listened with the grill on. You can take the grill off, the data shows a little bit worse performance. It's hard for me to do AB comparisons with the grill on versus grill off because of the asymmetric design and all that kind of stuff. So I can't confidently tell you you're going to hear a difference, but the data certainly indicates that there is a difference in the results. So it is advised to listen with the grill on. Okay, so with that aiming zero degrees pointed directly at me, that's what I would recommend personally. The soundstage radiation horizontally 
to me, I wish it were a little bit wider, right? And I think that it has a lot to do with maybe some cancellation from the mid-range to the tweeter because of their offset nature. I don't know. You know, at times I was like, oh, well, it's fine. And then other times I was like, well, it's, it seems a little bit more narrow than I personally want it to be. So it's kind of a mixture of me in that regard. My overall subjective impression is I do like the speaker. It's a pleasant sounding speaker that doesn't do anything to me that stands out as egregious or wrong. There are many speakers that I've listened to that just don't sound good. But with these particular speakers, I didn't find anything that stood out. I think that if you're looking for a Wharfdale Linton 85 in a smaller package, this isn't a direct replacement for it, but it's a suitable alternative for the Wharfdale Linton 85. So let's move on and talk about some of the data that I captured. All this data that you're about to see was captured using my state-of-the-art Clipple near field scanner. It allows me to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic environment and helps us dissect the speaker's performance and compare it objectively against other speakers. Now, I'm not saying that data is the end-all be-all, but I put a lot of stock in it and I put more stock in the data than I do some random guy's opinion. That includes my own, right? Oh, I would only trust somebody's opinion if they had something to point to. And, and that's that's me. You do whatever you want to do. Let's start off with the impedance. No resonances. It's a, it's a great thing when I see no box resonances from a speaker. And for what it's worth, there are no feet for me to have to screw in, to have to worry about box resonances or proven that the resonance is from the enclosure and not from having feet. Okay. Acoustic reference was at the tweeter. On axis response, there are a couple areas of interest. First one you'll see is this resonance right here. This is the one I talked about earlier. I'm not going to talk about it anymore because I covered that very well, or I hope I did at least. Uh, the upper dip in response right here is going to be audible. That's what I noticed in my ABX testing, but luckily it's not a peak. Peaks stand out more to me at least. Roughly 87 decibels, 86.6. Linearity is about plus or minus three decibels. This is the CEA 2034 data set. Let's look at the early reflections directivity index. We can see there's a dip from about two to four kilohertz, which means that this particular area is not going to be easily EQ'd if you, for example, maybe wanted to boost this up a little bit. You're gonna have a little bit more trouble getting the on-axis response to match the off-axis reflections in this particular area. But that's really driven by the asymmetry of the design. So if we look at the on-axis response horizontally in this dark red, here we go, right there. And then if we look at 10 degrees and minus 10 degrees, so 10 degrees one way, 10 degrees the other way, and these reds, one 10 degree increment tracks the on-axis response very well. The other one comes down by about three to five decibels or so. Same thing for 20 degrees in orange. We got some orange down here, it's a major scoop, and we got an orange right here that's linear, but then it kind of falls down here. 40 degrees, 40 degrees one way is pretty decent. You know, it kind of tracks the on-axis response. It's down by about three decibels, but the other way it's down by about, I don't know, maybe like eight decibels. So you can see that that offset nature is going to deliver a different sound to the reflected walls and that's why I recommended earlier, you might want to use some kind of absorption on the walls to help potentially make the focus and imaging a little bit more tighter. Let's compare the CEA 2034 data set of the grill on versus the grill off. Grill on again, grill off. What you'll notice is this two to four kilohertz dip is wider and there's a little bit more treble bump right through here. Therefore, I would recommend, at least for critical listening, that you keep the grills on. Estimated in-room response at zero degrees and 30 degrees. And for those of you who aren't aware, zero degrees means pointed directly at the listener. 30 degrees means parallel with the wall behind it pointed out into the room. This is how I heard the speaker in my room. There's a mild mid-range recess, again, about one decibel, and then this upper mid-range recess right there. But notice if you go 30 degrees one way, I probably should have put the other 30 degrees in here too, the other direction but you can have a more severe dip off axis. And that also is why I recommend listening to these speakers directly at you. Horizontal radiation is kind of all over the map. Again, asymmetric design. Vertically, you're about plus or minus 25 degrees. So that means you got a, a decent window to sit between at that tweeter axis. Harmonic distortion at 86 decibels and then at 96 decibels. Both of these look pretty good to me, actually. The issue appears when you look at multi-tone distortion. So at the highest output level of 96 decibels at one meter, you're pretty high in multi-tone distortion in the mid-range. 
If you go to the next step down, you're about 87 or so decibels at one meter. That's just down here, and you're below my personal threshold of about 3%. If you use these pair in a big room and you have to crank them up, then yeah, you're gonna run into distortion and you're gonna run into low frequency compression. If you use these in a medium size or smaller room, I don't think that you're necessarily gonna run into this particular distortion issue and you should be okay. Speaking of compression, you have about 20 decibels of dynamic range going from 76 decibels to 96 decibels where there's not a lot of change in the frequency response. However, when you go up to 26 decibels of dynamic range, this 102 decibels in purple, then you've got a swing in the mid range and more variation in the lower frequency. So I'd say, again, not a SPL powerhouse, but I don't think anybody would expect that. Real quick, let's compare the Wharfdale Super Denton CEA 2034 data set to the Linton 85. This is the Denton. This is the Linton. The Denton, you'll notice, again, this mid-range peak right here resonance, but not really audible, at least in my listening test. This mid-range scoop through here was audible, and this mid-range, upper mid-range scoop was audible to me as well. The Linton doesn't really have that. The Linton does have an upper mid-range scoop a little bit, but for the most part, I'd say it's more linear on axis. But the difference really shows up if you want to look at something like the estimated interim response. And really, that's going to be more along the lines of the early reflections, this dash blue. So to save myself from going and digging up the estimated interim response, I'm just going to show you how to look at this comparatively. The early reflections in this dash blue shows a mid-range dip around 1K or so. So that's going to take some maybe attack or clarity or something like that out of the music. Usually that's around like one to three K. If you look at the Super Denton, you can see that it's more linear through that region. It has a little bit of a peak around, what is that, four K or so. And the other difference is on this lower mid-range end. So those both align with what I heard. Overall, they are similar. They're definitely not the same. But if you're looking for a Linton, but smaller, then the Super Denton does make sense. That does it for this review. I wanna thank Mike, for sending these speakers out to me or actually having them drop shipped to me. That's really cool when people are willing to do that. And I really appreciate it. Everybody in the comments section, if you're interested or you like this review, please thank Mike for him sending this to me because without him, who knows when I would have been able to review it. If you're interested in supporting this channel, you can do so one of two ways. One would be at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. You can sign up there and you'll get some behind the scenes information, early looks at data, early looks at videos and I try to do stuff every now and again, maybe like a giveaway or something if I can. Another way would be to use my affiliate links. So sometimes I'll direct link an affiliate link to the item I'm reviewing, and then sometimes I don't, but I'll always use generic affiliate links. If you wanna buy whatever, and, and seriously, most of the time people don't even buy the thing that I'm reviewing, they'll buy something else. Like sometimes people will buy a television, or they'll buy a receiver, or they'll buy toothpaste. Or they'll buy books. I've seen all sorts of random things be purchased through my Amazon affiliate links. But if you want to use those to purchase anything from Crutchfield, Amazon, Best Buy, Target, Newegg, I've got other ones, Arendal, um, please consider using one of those affiliate links because it really does help me out in the long run and allows me to keep doing what I'm doing. And I really do appreciate that. With all that said, I appreciate you watching. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the section below. I will talk to you all later. Take care.